Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This I have privilege to uh, say a few good words about Dr. C.R. Devi, sir. He did his schooling from uh, SS High School, Vijayapur, where he taught. And he attended uh, Ferguson College Pune for uh, pre medical education. He did his MBBS graduation from where he was part of Mumbai University Athletics. He was Bombay University due in hockey, football, and he excelled in almost all athletic activities. He was the third fastest runner in India. He was selected to participate in the Home Olympics in 1960 along with Mika Singh. But unfortunately, prior to that, he developed post infectious neuropathy. After recovering partially from it, he started clinical practice in Vijay. During this period, he completed his general medicine, DCH, DVD, uh, TDD, along with FCPS, which was equivalent to him. He continued his clinical practice till two months before he passed out. He had multiple myeloma for which he underwent treatment for one year, one year before succumbing to the same. He was actively involved in IMA, API, and Rotary Club activities in Vijay. He was one of the three people who worked tirelessly to start Sri B.M. Patil Medical College under the leadership of Dr. B.M. Patil along with B.R. Patil Pinkal. On establishment of medical college, he was the first dean and served the institution from 1986 to 1994. We are eternally thankful and will always remain in debt to you, sir, for your contributions to this institution. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our chief patient, Dr. Nidhi Patil, sir, sends his warm regards with good wishes for the success of the program. Our very own Vice Chancellor, Dr. Aris Murgul, will be joining us. Dr. J.G. Ambedkar, our registrar, will participate in the proceedings. Likewise, Dr. Arvind Patil, Principal, Dean, Faculty of Medicine, along with the Vice Principal of Academics, Dr. S.V. Patil, will be a part of this program. Dr. Arun Inamla, the Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, and the recognized research scholar, will also be a part of this program. Our medical superintendent, Dr. Rajesh Kurnamri, due to health reasons, will be participating online. Dr. R.C. Pithri, former medical superintendent and principal, and currently serving as the professor of medicine, will be in our midst as a long served teaching faculty and representative of the late Dr. Sia Vidhi Today, we are blessed with a galaxy of highly qualified specialists in their chosen profession as participants in the CNA. Dr. Sandeep Nair, Secretary, Scientific Academic and Research Society, will present a bouquet to mark the participation of our guests. <laughs> At least call for Dr. Gigi on the universal and register on the test. Please call forward your friend Asi to the research, a former medical student and principal, and present to the In our tradition, the beginning of any auspicious event is always by lighting a lamp of illumination of knowledge with a brief prayer to the Almighty to bless the proceedings. I request the office bearers of SARS and the honorary members to come forward to light the lamp. Thank 
Now, it's time to begin the continuing medical education and I request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Alice Guru, to deliver the inaugural address. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am happy to inaugurate the Dr. C. R. Bidri Memorial Oration. This is the ninth in the series. To commemorate his this graced personality, I from the BLD University, I remember his contributions. He was the first pediatrician of the this part of the Karnataka, and he has shown the what is pediatric practice. Those days, generalists used to treat the pediatric patients. Then later on, he was associated with the starting of the Sri B.M. Patil Medical College and Hospital. And he is the first dean. And with his immense knowledge and the administrative experience, he has contributed for the starting of this medical college from 1986 to 1994. And MCI to get recognized this college, he has worked a lot. 1991, this college has been recognized by MCI. And he is as a, a well-known pediatrician, good teacher, able administrator, has contributed a lot to the PLD association, in particular, Sri BM Patil Medical College and Hospital and Research Center. To commemorate his services uh, to the humanity and BLD deemed to be university in the series to commemorate with his personality and his humanistic approach. We remember him on 2nd of the February every year. And today are the stalwarts in the oncology treatment. Dr. Dathatre, Dr. Janardhan, Dr. Milin Chetty, and Dr. Shailesh. They are going to give the insights of the treatment of the cancer patients in various aspects like medical oncology, radiotherapy, etc. I am happy to be associated with this, the great day, and to remember the stalwarts who has contributed to the immensely to the medical education and pediatric practice to the Vijayapura city. He would have settled in any one of the big cities, but to serve his own people, he has come here and his contribution to starting this medical college, which has helped a lot of patients and a lot of uh, students have become doctors in the last 35 years. And I think it is a apt CME to remember him and I declare open this ninth CME in his great memory of late Dr. C.R. Bidri. I welcome his son, Dr. Rajendra Bidri, who is always associated and advisor for this program and all the faculty members, Dean, Medical Faculty, Dr. Arvind Patil, Dr. Hannotki, Dr. Ambekar, Dr. Inamdar, and all other faculty members, Dr. Anand Patil and chairpersons. I think this program will give the insight of the cancer treatment. I'm happy to be associated. Thank you one and all. I declare open the CME. Now it's time for the continuing medical education to commence. Our inaugural speaker for the day is Dr. P.S. Dattatriya. He is a highly qualified individual with multiple qualifications to his credit, which shall be clear to you once his biodata is discredited. I request Dr. S. N. Bentley, Professor, Department of Medicine, the chairperson for the session, to please introduce the speaker. Good 
visible yes sir yes sir visible and i am i am completely i am clearly audible to all of you yes sir audible yeah thank you thank you so much uh, uh, the entire team uh, for making me a part of this august gathering and i intend to uh, take you on an overview about immuno oncology because that is the current uh, most recent advance in treatment of cancer and also give a deep dive into cancer immunotherapy so everyone you meet has something valuable to teach you and as i prepared for this presentation i also have learned a lot in this journey in the treatment of cancer way back in 1940s and 50s it was cytotoxic chemotherapy from that in the early 2000s or late 1990s has been targeted therapy and now we all talk about immunotherapy in cancer in life there's a purpose for every person you meet some are there to test you some will use you some will teach you and some will bring out the best in you so thank you so much bidri sir for this a greatest opportunity bestowed upon me so that i can uh, give give a give, give an on important take home messages about cancer immunotherapy and also about immuno oncology so as i have prepared to teach all of you i must acknowledge i also have learned a lot in this journey so let's look at the base the basis and the basics of immuno oncology and cancer immunotherapy i divide my talk into five sections and this is what i start with this was a a song with which all of us have grown this was a song by devanand uh, and uh, the ever beautiful vaida rahman and of course we all know the music director so section 1 of my talk the britishers ruled india by the policy of divide and rule now that was the dalhousie's policy and they tried to divide our country and then rule us and they did rule well for a time the t lymphocytes uh, as we all know at attack the viruses they also attack the bacterial cells and they also are able to attack and kill the cancer cells now if you want to win the fight against cancer you possibly have to divide the cancer into subtypes so that you can divide them into subtypes and find out the right way to rule this obnoxious disease immuno oncology talks about unleashing the t cell army against the cancer cells because the neoplastic pathology has been able to blunt the body's immune system and therefore make the t cells inactive or subdued the 200 known cancer types can be divided into three basic categories if you want to unleash the t cell army against the against this cancer one would be inflamed tumor which means that the tumor has lot of inflammatory cells inflammatory t lymphocytes and uh, therefore you find that the biopsy report will show a lot of inflammatory cells the second could be the inflammatory cells or the immune cells are able to reach the periphery of the tumor 
but they're not able to infiltrate into the tumor. And the third category, the last one is, the tumor is so bland, the tumor is so naive, it's not able to elicit any immune response at all. So that would be called as a immune desert, which means the tumor, the body is not able to acknowledge the presence of tumor itself. So number one is an inflammatory tumor, where you find all the T cells infiltrating into the neoplastic uh, area. The second is they have reached the periphery of the tumor, but they are not able to reach into the tumor. Therefore, they are not able to attack the cancer cells directly. And the third is an immune desert, which means that the immune cells are not even able to identify the presence of the neoplasm in the body. So those are three types based on immuno-oncology. Section 1B of my talk, the Nobel Prize should give patients hope. The 2018 Nobel Prize in Medicine Physiology was given jointly to James P. Allison and Tasuko Honjo. And why were they given the Nobel Prize? Because they discovered that you could treat cancer by inhibiting negative immune regulation. So minus and minus becomes plus. The immune system of the body is negated and kept in check. It is negatively influenced by the cytokines released from the cancer cells. And what do you? You try to inhibit this negativity. Therefore, you are able to negate the negativity of the immune dysregulation caused by the cancer. So inhibition of negative immune regulation is what these two people said could help us in fighting the disease. They showed how a protein on immune cells can be used to manipulate the immune system so that the immune system now becomes restrengthened to identify and attack the cancer cells. I'll talk about James P. Allison and for Allison, cancer has not been new to him. His mother died of lymphoma in his 11 years of age. His brother died around 16 years back with advanced prostate cancer. So he had this deep urge to try to find out something which can be uh, useful for cancer patients. And that deep urge, that scientific thirst made him thrust him into the field of immunology and immunology. And that has now made a lot of difference in cancer treatment. So that's about James P. Allison and his tryst with cancer. Section two of my talk, in 2A, I will talk about the immunity cycle. In 1A, I spoke about dividing the cancer types into an inflammatory tumor, an immune accelerated tumor, and an immune desert. Immunity cycle, the step one is the cancer cell dies and starts liberating various antigens. Otherwise also, actively proliferating cancer cells can keep on liberating antigens. Now, these antigens in step two are identified and recognized by the antigen presenting cells, for example, the dendritic cells. Because as you know, this antigen directly cannot be identified by the T lymphocytes. It is processed by the antigen presenting cell. And then step three, this dendritic cell will then modify the antigen so that it can now be active, it, it can now reach T lymphocytes, it can then prime the T lymphocytes and activate them to identify these cancer antigens. So the priming and activation of T lymphocytes cannot happen directly by the cancer. It can happen only when the cancer antigens are uh, modified and processed by the dendritic cell in step two. Now, step four, these activated T lymphocytes then go in the bloodstream and then try to find out where all is the cancer so that it can reach the cancer and then try to eliminate these cancer antigen expressing neoplastic tumors. That's called as T cell trafficking. Step five, now the T cells have reached the periphery of the tumor and they now have to enter into the tumor, which is T cell infiltration of the neoplastic mass. Last two steps. Step six, inside the tumor now, these activated and primary T lymphocytes can identify the cancer cells and then they would understand that, yes, this is the neoplastic tumorous cells 
and so they will be able to kill the neoplastic T cells. But before this step seven, before the killing of the cancer cells can happen, there are two important things which have to take place. Number one, these cancer cells have a shield around them. For example, expression of the PDL1, programmed death ligand 1 on the cancer cell works like a shield to prevent the T cells from attacking them. And number two, we all know about say our Bollywood heroes, be it Shah Rukh Khan or Salman Khan or the Hollywood heroes or even heroes uh, from across any of the local channels, they work best to eliminate the enemy only when can, they can take off their shirts off. So even the, even the inhibitory sheaths around the T lymphocytes have to be removed for them to attack the cancer cell. So what I showed here was on one hand the PDL1 working as a shield on the cancer cell and number two various inhibitory factors working like a coat on the T lymphocytes like LAG3, IDO and digit. And these two things have to be removed so that now the cancer T cells with nothing inhibiting them and uh, the T cell and, and the cancer cells are now exposed because the shield or the sheath has been destroyed. And thus the seventh step happens of killing the neoplastic cells by the activated and primed T lymphocytes. So these are the seven steps of the immunity cycle. The step one is liberation from the uh, cancer cells of the cancer antigens. Step two, these cancer antigens are then uh, by the dendritic cells received and they know how to present the antigen to the T lymphocytes. Step three is priming and activation of the T lymphocytes by these dendritic cells. Step four is T cell trafficking in the bloodstream. Step five, reaching the tumor and then infiltrating the tumor. Step six and step seven is identifying the cancer neoplastic cells and making sure the PDL1 shield is abolished and the inhibitory coat on the T lymphocytes also is removed. Coming to section 2B of my talk, I ended section 1B with James P. Allison and his twist with cancer. Now, this lady in picture is an Indian born American woman by name Padmani Sharma. I'll now try to show what Padmani Sharma has. Uh, uh, the, the relationship she has with James P. Allison. But is she the favorite student of James Allison? Or are they research collaborators in the fight against cancer? Or is she his personal secretary who helps him day in and day out in his presentations in various conferences? Or is she his daughter, his niece, or some relative? So what's the relationship which Padmani Sharma at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas in the USA has with James P. Allison. Are they an esteemed, uh, esteemed colleagues in the same lab or department? By outward appearance, both of them are pretty opposite. She is 47 years old, she's striking, uh, beautiful and model thin, and he is 69, rumpled and pudgy. But equally pronounced are their similarities. They bonded years ago because they had a shared obsession with T lymphocytes, with immunology, with immune oncology. And these days, Padmani Sharma tells us we talk about data all the time at dinner and even while brushing our teeth. The cancer fighting power couple are husband and wife, and they have been hugely successful in unlocking some of the deepest mysteries of the immune system. Interest in immunology made them interested in each other. Covalent bonding continued until the, at this chemistry was uh, cracked the age barrier because there was bonding among them and that bonding was research and interest in T lymphocytes. Finally, physical proximity permanently in 2014 when they finally got married. And you can now see both of them walking hand in hand when Nobel Prize got announced in 2018 with all the media uh, hounding them once 
he got the nobel prize in medicine or physiology in 2018 because he discovered about the importance of negatively influencing the negative immune regulation by the cancer and that could be used as cancer treatment section 3 of my talk coming to 3a will integrate what we learned in section 1a and 2a let's integrate the immune divisions and the immunity cycle so step 1 2 and 3 was antigen release presentation and priming activation and if this does not happen then you can understand that the neoplasm is not identified by the t cells at all and therefore it becomes an immune desert so unless step 1 2 or 3 happens the neoplastic tumor would be an immune desert and the body can't even identify that something wrong is multiplying inside step 4 and step 5 are t cell trafficking and to some extent just reaching the periphery of the tumor so if this step 5 doesn't have infiltration does not happen then it would be labeled as a tumor is able to in, in exclude the immune cells and that's why it becomes an immune excluded because the immune cells know something wrong is proliferating they are able to reach that area but not able to infiltrate and so step 5 is not happening when you have a tumor which is immune excluded and lastly you could have a inflamed tumor where it's able to enter into the tumor identify that cancer cells are there which are antigens but the killing is not happening because uh, the pdl1 sheath uh, or the shield is yet to be destroyed or the negative inhibition on the t cells has to be removed so this is how you can integrate the immunity cycle with the three immune divisions of the 200 known cancer types so that's the integration there and with that you can possibly decide which patient can get which type of treatment an inflammatory tumor could be a different treatment and an, an immune desert might require a different approach when you plan to use immune oncology molecules in cancer treatment section 3b so i told you that the, the that the coat on the t lymphocytes which inhibits them from fighting the cancer cells okay, is called as pd1 or program death one now the pdl1 on the on the cancer cells is in front pd1 and therefore is telling the t cells not to liberate the perforins or the harmful cytotoxic molecules one such agent also is called as ctla4 cytotoxic t lymphocytes fourth antigen so cytotoxic t lymphocytes can kill the, uh, the the cancer cells but it is kept in check by inhibition molecules like ctla4 or pd1 now why do you need to inhibit the t cells otherwise these t cells can end up causing lot of autoimmune diseases in us so t lymphocytes have activating factors and inhibition factors so that the t lymphocytes don't end up causing autoimmune diseases in all of us this is what the cancer exploits by making sure the inhibitory receptors are kept in are kept activated by interacting with them for example pd11 interacts with pd1 pd1 or with ctla4 cytotoxic t lymphocyte antigen protein 4 is there for an immune checkpoint which will down regulate the immune responses so that we don't end up in autoimmune disease the same thing also is what the cancer does and it therefore down regulates the body's cytotoxic t lymphocytes from attacking it similarly we have t cyto cd8 positive cytotoxic t cells we have cd4 positive t helper cells on the t helper cells so that the t helper cells don't help the cd8 positive t cells you have one more immune checkpoint called as icos icos inducible t cell co stimulator the role of ctla4 in immune oncology was identified by james t allison and he understood that the t lymphocytes if you are able to remove the ctla4 then these t lymphocytes can now become active the role of icos 
in immuno oncology was identified by padmani sharma inducible t cell co stimulator so that's the link between uh, the cd8 positive cytotoxic t cells and the cd4 positive helper t cells both of them have their activity kept in kept in check by using this negative immune uh, proteins on those cells and therefore these are labeled as checkpoints and it is these checkpoints which is uh, which is what the cancer cells exploit so that the checkpoints are able to keep the immune cells in check and therefore the immune cells can't eliminate the neoplastic t cells so james p allison has been responsible for the checkpoint blockade approach the checkpoint is blocking the t cells from attacking the cancer cells so you block the checkpoints and therefore the t cells become active and that's therefore called as the checkpoint blockade approach in cancer immunotherapy now this man is a pioneer in cancer treatment he has spent decades tackling major scientific challenges what comes as surprise is one of the top five moments of his life he labels as jamming on stage working or dancing on stage with country star willie nelson in addition to being a top flight scientist at the md anderson cancer center at uh, in houston allison heads and owns and is part of a musical band he loves music a lot and that musical band plays in texas at various uh, meetings and you know what the name of the band is the name of the band is checkpoints his love for music and his passion for immunocology is so great that the musical band he plays where he he heads the musical band he owns it and that's called as the checkpoints can i get some water <clears throat> okay coming to section 4 of my talk section 4a is about activate infiltrate and eliminate so here you can see the brown dendritic t cell activating the the brown dendritic cell activating the blue t cell that's therefore activation then number 2 these t cells are then able to reach the in the tumor area infiltrate that and therefore infiltration becomes important and lastly by producing various perforins various cytotoxic enzymes these t lymphocytes then kill the cancer cell but elimination can happen only if the pdl1 is not present for example as you can see here the t lymphocyte has reached but is not able to kill the tumorous mass that's because the cancer cells are over expressing those purple pdl ones on their surface the program death ligand 1 and once that shield is there on cancer cell then a pdl1 over expressed cancer cells will not be able to uh, will, will not will be able to uh, make sure that the t lymphocytes will not be able to attack them so with this pdl over expression happening the t lymphocytes cannot be able to eradicate the tumor cells the pdl1 inhibitors so if you could have a drug which is an antibody against pdl1 now these are called as pdl1 antibodies anti pdl1 antibodies they will then go in the body they will work against the pdl1 cancer cells and that would lead to the cancer cells being killed so these are drugs which are now available in the market and pdl inhibitors therefore reinvigorate the activated t lymphocytes now the t lymphocytes with the shield on the pdl1 cells removed because of the pdl inhibitors that is the other one na bhai ke upar tal paise na man to bas okay so now we therefore understand that how in the immunity cycle you activate the t cells the t cells infiltrate the tumor and then they eliminate the neoplastic tumorous mass similarly on the t cells i told you we have pd1 pd1 is inhibiting the t cells from attacking the 
the, the, the sheet, the, 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 the coat on the T cells has to be removed. And so you could use PD-1 inhibitors. Once you are able to block the PD-1 by using anti PD antibody, the exhausted T cells can again become reactivated. And now these T cells can get, get all the vigor to attack the neoplastic tumorous cells. So atezolizumab is in India available. It's a pdl one antibody. It's given once in 21 days. Nemolumab and pembrolizumab are anti-PD-1 antibodies. They are given once in two or once in three weeks. And lastly, we have durvalumab, which is a pdl one antibody given every two weeks or three weeks, depending on the cancer scar. So we have in India two anti-PDL1 antibodies and two anti-PD1 antibodies. Expression of PDL1 is one important way in which you can identify which cancer can respond well to immunotherapy. More importantly, please understand that initially when you start the patient on the immuno-oncology molecules, it is stimulating the body's immune cells and these immune cells then reach the cancerous area, infiltrate that area, and therefore the number of cells in that area will increase. So you might find after four weeks or eight weeks, the lesions actually have increased. And that's because the tumor cells are there and the immune cells further have reached there and they have not yet started to kill them. You find improvement after that and therefore if you do a scan for example after six weeks you might actually find that say the lung lesions of cancer actually have doubled in size that actually means that the immune cells have reached the tumorous area and are now working on the cancer cells and therefore doing a scan earlier will give a false impression of pseudo progression a false impression of progressive disease and therefore you find from week 12 the improvement happening. So be patient with your patient on immunotherapy because initially you want to say response in four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks, you actually end up finding that the, that the, that the size has actually doubled. That's because the immune cells have reached the cancerous tumor. Week 16 improvement, week 72 complete response. So you can have complete responses just by stimulating the body's immune T cells to fight the cancer. Looking at two more patients of non-small cell lung cancer, initially you find the lesions are small. At two months, you find the lesions have doubled in size. Only again at four months, you find the lesions have disappeared significantly. So you need to make sure the response assessment is not hurried when you put your patients on immuno-oncology molecules. Are these drugs without side effects? We are possibly stimulating the body's immune cells to also attack some of the body's uh, or, or own cells and that could lead to autoimmune complications like thyroiditis, hypophysitis, adrenal insufficiency, pneumonitis, etc. But how troublesome are these side effects? For example, you take this drug Pembrolizumab, a PD-1 blocking antibody in non-small cell lung cancer, the incidence is less than 4%. So these side effects are rare, they are transient, they are temporary, they are reversible and easily manageable. This is how these, these are called as adverse events related to immunotherapy and that's why it's called as IRAEs, immune related adverse events. You can see at what time these side effects appear could be skin rash, itching, liver side effects, diarrhea, colitis or hypophysitis. You need to know when can these side effects appear to according tackle them. Now, ipilimumab is an anti-CTLA4 antibody targeting the dendritic cells directly. In fact, those patients who have these adverse events, it means the drug actually has worked well and they actually have a chance of better outcome. So patients who get side effects are the ones 
where immune therapy has worked better and therefore you find that the outcomes are better than those patients who have no side effects i'll not say a big difference but then don't worry about a patient getting side effects of these molecules if a patient already has a autoimmune condition well realize that does not become a contraindication to immunotherapy even patients having pre existing autoimmune disorder can go on to get immune oncology molecules provided you closely watch these patients for worsening of their autoimmune disorder section 4b in chess you say checkmate only in the last you move in silence and speak when it's time to say checkmate now checkmate 25 was a trial of nivolumab in clear cell renal cell carcinoma and nivolumab the anti pd1 drug did much better than the conventional standard avrolimus checkmate 40 was a trial of liver cancer where they compared it to a standard treatment called as sorafenib and patients on nivolumab did much better than the patients who were on sorafenib checkmate 141 is a trial of nivolumab in squamous cell carcinoma head and neck advanced disease and they did these patients on nivolumab did better than patients who got conventional chemotherapy so immunotherapy surpassing chemotherapy in various areas checkmate 205 is in classical hodgkins lymphoma and compared to standard combination chemos nivolumab worked better so all the trials of nivolumab wherever you find checkmate as trial name understand that that's a nivolumab trial so patients are on nivolumab and therefore the trial name is checkmate james p allison i told you the local band he plays in his region in his uh, in his um, in his state is called as the checkmates uh, and, and and the band across the entire country is called as checkmates the local band is called as checkpoints and the band in the entire country is called as checkmates so that's the passion this man has against immune oncology here you find james p allison and padmani sharma with country star willie nelson all of them posing and that's one of his top five moments of life the last section of my talk section 5 so section 5a is immunotherapy is here to stay and will be the future suppose you have a inflammatory tumor the t cells already have reached into the tumor it's just that the sheath or the shield around the a cancer cells has to be removed and that's why you can use a single agent molecule like in this patient of extensive non small cell lung cancer you put them on a single agent atezolizumab an anti pd and antibody and you find dramatic responses so inflammatory tumor single agent is enough your patient has a immune exclusion tumor the t cells have reached the periphery what do you do you use two antibodies block ctla4 and also remove the pd1 which is inhibiting the t lymphocytes from infiltrating the tumor so you are making the t cells more active by making sure dendritic cells activate more t cells and then these t cells you block the pd1 so that they can infiltrate the tumor cell that therefore a double approach to immune ex the tumors so this is durable gen target lesions multiple big big nodes of hodgkins lymphoma a combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab showing excellent response lastly for immune deserts they are not liberating cancer antigens at all what do you do you try to make the tumor immunogenic by giving first some chemotherapy or some radiation or chemo and radiation and then because of these radiations and cytotoxic can causing death now the cancers can liberate the cancer antigens and then you can use immunotherapy afterwards as maintenance or consolidation so before immune therapy the survival was this much which has now improved a lot after various combinations of chemotherapy radiation therapy immunotherapy and target therapy we are therefore looking at patients who can get cured despite having stage 4 cancers 
last part of my talk, section 5b, the Keynote 24 trial looks at pembrolizumab trials. All trials of nivolumab are checkmate trials. The checkpoint blockade approach by James P. Allison is local band is called as checkpoint. The checkmate trials are nivolumab trials. James P. Allison's national band in the entire country is called as checkmates. Keynote 24 are pembrolizumab trials looking at pembro versus various chemo combinations. So what's the keynote which James P. Allison plays in his band, checkmates and checkpoints? Can you guess this? Can you see him performing to the extreme right there? Uh, or maybe a closer look can give you a guess about what this person does in his local, in, in, his, in his checkpoints and checkmate bands. I told you about this song, which is what I started with. And the beauty of the song is the music. And that was his friend uh, singing on the mouth organ there. So the harmonic or mouth organ is what James P. Allison plays in his musical band, the checkpoints and the checkmates. The role of ICOS in immunology was identified. Am I audible? Yeah, was identified by Padmani Sharma. James P. Allison drives a Tesla and the number plate of his car is ICOS ICOS. That's the love he has for his wife and the passion for immunology. Is, so the role of ICOS in immunology was uh, by Padmani Sharma discovered and James P. Allison drives a Tesla and the car number is ICOS. Is Padmani Sharma far behind? The role of CTLA-4 was discovered by James P. Allison and she drives a Porsche and the number plate is CTLA-4. So that was what I wanted to teach you all about immuno-oncology and immune therapy, an overview and a deep dive. Thank you so much, everyone. So the session open for yeah. no question. Let us move to the next lecture by Dr. Janardhan Nandiga. Janardhan Nandiga sir is a medical physicist who completed his graduation from Anna University in Chennai in 95. First basic interest is in radio oncology. Over 27 years, he has worked in this field and he has got numerous publications in national and international journals. He is one of the co investigators in the medicine trial for intravascular breaking therapy. Sir is very much hardworking, well trained, experienced in medical disease. With the ability to work with the research equipment and techniques in radiotherapy. Sir is currently serving as the Chief Technology Officer at Renault Hospital. Now he will be talking about the recent advances in radiation oncology. Over to Sir, Dr. Janavan Nandi. Good evening, all. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. That was a uh, very nice words from you people. I would like to thank uh, BLD for uh, uh, allowing us to present what we have uh, been doing for all these years. And then special thanks to Bidri sir for uh, personally inviting us for the talk. Can you see the video? No, sir. Okay. Now we can see. Now is it okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, sorry. So basically, what I'll be doing for the next 10 to 15 minutes, I'll not be talking much, but uh, what we will do is I'll just take you through the journey of radiation therapy. I know many uh, people would not be so 
uh, familiar with what exactly happens in radiation. So I, we will be just going through the uh, discoveries and how we, we move from the uh, 2D conventional uh, treatment era to today what we do as what we call sublimit accuracy in radiation oncology. That is what is my topic is going to be today. So we all know that radiation plays a crucial role in the cancer treatment. And uh, radiation is used to treat, uh, kill the radiation, I mean the cancer cells. And we also use it for shrinking the tumors. Uh, as such, you, oncology is a multidisciplinary team. Uh, so we have the radiation oncologists who work in tandem with the medical uh, and the surgical oncologists. And within radiation oncology, you again have a sub multidisciplinary team in terms of the medical physicists and the radiotherapy technologists who work with the radiation oncologists on a day in, day out basis to make sure that what our plan has been done for the patients in terms of treatment delivery has been done uh, precisely and correctly. So, we all know uh, radiation is the emission or transmission of energy in the form of waves or particles. So, basically, radiation is a wave. Uh, we, that's how we do it. So we can probably categorize radiation into two. One is ionizing radiation and the other one is non-ionizing radiation. We are all familiar with what non-ionizing radiation is all about. These are the day-to-day -day activities or day-to-day -day, uh, encounter which we have in our daily lifestyle in terms of microwaves uh, or radios, what we use, the infrared lights the ultraviolet light or the visible light, these are all non-ionizing radiation. But there is the other category which is very important and which is our topic of discussion here today is the ionizing radiation, which is mostly used in the treatment and also in the diagnosis of uh, the diseases. So basically classifying the ionizing radiation, we have the X-rays, gamma rays and the electrons and then the heavy ions fall in where the proton and carbon ion are the uh, heavy ions which we use. So if you see in the uh, picture, we see that uh, once we get into a range of ionizing radiation, we have these X-rays which are either used to uh, take the pictures of the uh, anatomy where the X-rays and the CT images are done. And then of course, gamma rays and the photons are used for treating the patients. So again, ionizing radiation, uh, we can classify them as alpha radiation, beta radiation, and uh, gamma radiation and also we have the electromagnetic magnetic wave range which is the gamma radiation and the X radiation. Uh, what actually happens when a patient receives radiation, we know that there is a DNA damage or a DNA split which happens. So when it's an high speed ionizing radiation damages the DNA within the cancer cells and they destroy their ability to reproduce. So we all know that the cancer cells are going to mutate, there's going to be a multiplication of these cells in our body. So what exactly ionizing, ionizing radiation does is to destroy or probably send that signal to make sure that there is no further ability to reproduce and then the body naturally eliminates these damaged uh, cancer cells. And the normal cells cannot be affected by radiation, but for the simple fact that they have the capacity to repair themselves, whereas the the cancer cells doesn't have the capacity to uh, repair themselves because of the double strand break or the single strand break which happens at the DNA level. So in what happens when an ionizing radiation is delivered on a patient? In the cell level is there are multiple pathways because of which there is an induced gene expression and also we what we call it as double strand DNA break which happens and then the protein molecules of ATM and ATR suspends to these genes and then either there is a DNA repair or a G2 arrest or a G1 arrest which ultimately leads to the apoptosis or the cell death. So what are the features of radiotherapy which we are looking at here is one of course as I told you they destroy the tumors that are not spread to the other body parts and it also reduces the risk that cancer will return after surgery or chemotherapy. Basically we are looking at trying to uh, do the treatment for the microscopic spread otherwise would have happened after the surgery or the chemotherapy uh, when the patients are uh, diagnosed with cancer. And then the shrinking of tumors affects the quality of life. It in fact improves the quality of life and also in the palliation of the patient where it alleviates the pain by reducing the size of the tumor. Uh, what are the 
types of so basically radiation therapy can be divided into two one we call it as external beam radiation the other we call it as internal beam radiation or brachytherapy so what happens in external beam radiation therapy is a method where we deliver high energy gamma or electron beams to a patient's tumor and beams are used to be generated by a linear accelerated or and targeted they are targeted to destroy the cancer cells by sparing the normal tissues so basically when you do external beam radiation it can be to the head it can be to the chest it can be to the abdomen or abdominal wall depending upon what area you are treating and which tumor you are treating whereas as i told you in brachytherapy where it is otherwise called as internal therapy this is a type of internal radiation in which uh, radiation radio isotopes are used like iridium or cesium or cobalt they are used in terms they are actually put into the patient's uh, cavity or patient interstitially they are inserted in the patient system and then radiation is delivered close to the target so brachytherapy is a local treatment and treats only a specific part of your body unlike in the external radiation you have a wider range of tumor and you treat a wider area of uh, uh, treatment region so internal radiation you can treat eye cancers you can treat breast cancers you can do a lot of gynecological cancers like endometrium cervix uh, post operative and uh, cervixes you can also do bladder and prostate cancers with brachytherapy and of course skin cancers can also be uh, treated with brachytherapy so there are many advances which have been made in the field to ensure it remains safe and effective there are multiple healthcare professionals who have developed and review the treatment plan as i told you we have the medical physicists and the radiation therapy technologists who actually are the backbone of radiation uh, planning and radiation delivery in the uh, treatment areas so radiation can be used either for curative or adjuvant or non adjuvant and palliative treatments and treatment depends on where it is located and what stage it is and then the general health condition of the patient of course you can also use radiation for both benign and malignant tumors malignant tumors of course these are tumors which are consistently dividing and then we need to uh, treat them either uh, with high dose or low dose of radiation persistently like benign diseases we can uh, do a high dose of vaccination for these patients so how does uh, we how does actually uh, radiotherapy evolve uh, there is a spanning study here i'm sorry for that it's basically evolution of radiation therapy it all started in 1895 with william conrad ranjan uh, discovering x rays and then basically he started uh, exposing his hands and then that's how he is came to know that these are something which where we can start using for treating also initially he started using for treatment of patients whereas he actually the x rays were used for diagnosis purpose and that's where he was uh, given nobel prize for discovering x rays and in 19 Three is when the radio therapy uh, moved into a different level. Actually, the, the discovery of uh, uh, the uh, radioactive isotope uh, by Henry Henry Becquerel and Henry Curie uh, laid the path for uh, the treatment of uh, cancers with the radioactive isotopes. And Mary Mary Curie was awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for discovering radium and polonium. in the year 1911 when and going through all these years uh, we moved towards an era of uh, discovery to the kilo voltage area and then mega voltage area so we started using kilo voltage x-rays for treatment of uh, cancers and then from that we moved to mega voltage uh, radiation and that's where linear accelerators were used for delivering high energy photons for deep seated tumors and electrons for superficial lesions and from that um, mega voltage era we also move to what is called as three dimensional treatments and high precision modern radiotherapy era this actually was the path breaking or a paradigm shift in the treatment of cancers because from an area era where we were actually treating large volumes where because of lack of technology because of the limitations of the technology what we had today we are moved to an era where high precision radiation therapy with sublimit accuracy is possible just because the 
Today, the technology has moved towards uh, where the machines can deliver high dose of radiation in a shorter interval of time. So, we moved 3D, we started using 3D conformal radiation to start with. So, 3D conformal radiation therapy is a technique that incorporates the use of imaging technologies to generate three dimensional images of a patient's tumor. And there also, we can, uh, nearby organs and tissues can be uh, saved. From 3D CRT, because uh, no tumor is going to be of same shape, same volume, and same size. Uh, we had the limitations in the 3D conformal radiation therapy. We were able to conform the radiation to three dimensionally, but we were not able to modulate the dose to the volume changes otherwise. That's where the IMRT treatments. Uh, there's a, can you see my presentation? Okay. Yeah. So, IMRT was introduced. So, intensity modulation radiation therapy is a type of radiation therapy uh, where we use to treat cancers and non cancerous tissues. And as I told you, we were able to modulate those due to, uh, with the intensity and with the volumes. So, this is the difference between uh, 3D CRT and how a 3D CRT treatment and an IMRT treatment would look like. We see here. Oh, we are not getting sorry. We are not getting the I got a message. The host has stopped the video. Uh, the... Please share your screen, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Is it visible now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, as I was telling you, this is the uh, picture of uh, 3D conformal radiation therapy visibus, the IMRT treatment. So, where you can clearly see the 3D conformal, we were able to conform the radiation to the uh, target gate, but still there was dose spill to the normal organs like the pelvic bones and the bowels here in the 3D conformal radiation therapy. But when we move to IMRT treatment, we can we can deliver the high dose of radiation to the target precisely and still cut down the dose to the other critical organs. And we were also modulating the dose and we were actually, if you see, here it is more a, a square shaped uh, dose uh, sculpting which has happened here, dose distribution here, whereas here you can see the dose is completely modulated and then it has taken the shape of the organ here. And then from image guided radiotherapy we moved because what has what had happened is in IMRT, although we were able to conform the treatments, the treatment time was on the higher side. And we found that the more the patient spends the treatment, uh, the time in the treatment room, we, you, we have started having the patients get, uh, moving during the course of the treatment. And then that's when we thought probably we should have something much more faster than what an IMRT treatment could do. And that's where rapid up or BMAT volumetric modulated arc therapy which came into existence. So it's a very novel radiation therapy technique that delivers the radiation continuously as the machine rotates through the patient. And by this, what happens is it accurately shapes the radiation dose to the tumor while we minimize the dose to the organs and the surrounding tumor. And all when all this was happening, I ne we never had a system to actually see what is happening inside the patient when radiation is being delivered. And that was what triggered to the evolution of image guided radiotherapy, wherein you, you are treating the patient, but you are not exactly knowing what is happening inside the patient when the radiation is being delivered or when radiation treatment is happening to the patient. So that is when the image guided radiotherapy came into existence, where we do image guidance on certain tumors, especially moving targets like lung cancers, prostate tumors, or pancreatic tumors where the target is going to move continuously during the course of radiation, you need to have a guidance for your treatment and that's what image guided treatment brought us. So what we did is we did, we brought a comb beam CT onto the machine and then we started imaging the patient even before the radiation treatment is delivered on that particular day or during the course of the treatment on that particular day. 
So this is the rapida treatment. If you go back and then visualize our IMRT treatment, this was the dose pill when I was doing IMRT and this was the dose pill which I, when we were doing 3D conformal radiation. So from there, if you see the rapid up treatment or a volumetric modulated after therapy, I have completely started pulling my doses to the other critical organs inside. So now you see my bowel doses would have gone down, my bone doses would have gone down. And it also, what it also allowed me to do was do to allow more dose escalation into the tumor and to the target. So my limitation, which otherwise was not able to put adequate doses because of the limitation, the technology now started giving me, giving me the advantage of putting high dose into the target and thereby also sparing the critical organs around the uh, OARs and the organs are pressed. And this is what the image guided therapy was, was talking about, where we do the imaging on the treatment machine. So we have the reference CT, which I have done while planning the patient. And I can do an image on the patient on the machine and then check if my target is within the range, if the patient is within the range, if the patient has been set up correctly and then deliver the radiation. So from moving on to that error to today, what we call it as hyperarch. Hyperarch is a very high precise uh, treatment technique. Uh, which uh, presently is now used for uh, treating brain tumors, where it is an end-to-end -end class solution for treatment of hypertrophic targets, and it delivers very high dose of radiation. Remember, I was talking about benign tumors and malignant tumors, and especially in benign tumors like CP angle tumors, meningiomas, and trigeminal neuralgias, where the target sizes are very small, but you need to pump in more doses because the fact being they are benign tumors. So my end response, what I look for benign tumors is basically cell death or necrosis in cell. So that's where high dose of fractions, fractions have to be given. And I need to have a system which can deliver very high dose and the hyperarch allows me to do that. From the era of three-dimensional radiation to image guided radiation to rapid arc, we also what is called as four-dimensional radiation therapy. So what happens in four-dimensional radiation therapy? These are basically used in those targets, as I was telling, like moving targets and targets are which are going to move due to respiratory movement or due to other involuntary and voluntary actions in patient. This is a case scenario where you see a lung tumor is being treated. If I have a lung tumor which is as small as this, and if I don't have a system which can track the tumor or which can track the patient's respiratory motion, then when I'm treating the patient, I will have to treat a volume as big as this because this is the movement which is going to be because of the motion move which is going to be there due to the respiration. But when I bring in the 4D gated treatment or four-dimensional respiration, respiratory treatment or a radiotherapy treatment, what happens is I can do a gated treatment wherein when the treatment, when the beam, when the target is within the range, the beam is on, and when the target is which is not in the range, the beam is off. So by this, what I can do is, I can exactly shape my treatment area to this and not by treating this. So the compensation or the compromise which would have happened because of not having a 4D treatment available can be avoided. So what happens in 4D RT is, it aims to track and compensate for the target motion during the radiation treatment and thereby minimizing the normal tissue and injury and especially you can reduce the critical organ losses. So non-operable or inoperable lung tumors clinically and those patients where the tumors are very small, you don't have to treat the patient for five to six weeks. I can do a treatment for hypofractionated treatment, something which is called a saber or stereotactic ablative body radiation therapy in five days. So your four weeks of radiation now comes down to four or days or five days. So from right all this time I was talking about photons, X-rays, gamma rays. So now we also have what is called as proton therapy. India right now has got one center. In fact, the second center in Dhaka University is also starting for proton therapy. What is the biggest advantage of proton therapy is what we call as the BRAC peak. So unlike in 
the regular photon radiation where it is a decay curve, where it is in uh, uh, the curve, there is a skin dose, there is a peak, and then there is an apparent dose fall off. But in proton therapy, the biggest advantage is there is absolutely no entry dose and no exit dose. So you can see there are two comparative uh, pictures here. When I do an X-ray therapy or a photon-based radiation therapy, this is my dose spill. I am treating this, but I am also leaving the dose onto the normal organs here. But with proton therapy, as I told you, there is absolutely no entry and exit dose. So you are able to sculpt the dose exactly to the tumor and then taking away the entry and exit doses. Where is it going to be helpful? These are the tumor, the, these are patients who are pediatric patients, rhabdomyosarcomas, retinoblastomas, and craniopharyngiomas in children. These are the patients who are going to be suitable for proton therapy. And in the adults, prostate tumor finds a very suitable uh, indication for proton therapy. Uh, advanced, uh, the other advances of uh, radiation oncology is what I was talking about, the brachytherapy, the internal radiation. These are few applications of brachytherapy at different sites which we can do. Like I was saying, these are the carcinoma breast where we can do a reverse boost. Before taking the patient for the whole breast radiation, you can do, do the treatment by using internal radiation with, in the carcinoma breast. These are breast. This is a breast implant. And then for similarly for carcinoma prostate, you can do an implant for the prostate, for soft tissue sarcoma, and for CA cervix. The, big, the other advantage, the physics of brachytherapy is so good that as of today, there is no better conformal radiation with very steep dose gradient in brachytherapy. What we can achieve in brachytherapy cannot be achieved in any other forms of radiation therapy. So from those era of uh, photons to protons, today there is another big uh, leap in radiation oncology is improving the outcomes by doing biological targeting. There are certain bi biological uh, molecules of where we can use, we, these can be tagged into radio pharmaceuticals and can be used in trying to do the proliferation of, uh, I mean, you can use them for targeting very precisely on smaller targets of tumors and then treat them. So basically what we do is we try to induce hypoxia in these tumors and then induce the cell death. So 18FF, uh, EF3, which is a 2-nitro imidazole marker is a uh, biological uh, tool which is being used. And then 18FF, FDG is another uh, uh, molecule. And then C11, carbon and then MET is Again, used in metabol metabolic, uh, it actually helps in metabolism of tumors. So, to put it in a nutshell, in 1935, in an era of KVRT, where we have been using 200 kilovolts of RT and delivering the 40 gray of those, we have moved from there to carbon ions today, where we can deliver 100 gray to a patient with absolutely no dose spill. So from NAC two-dimensional treatment, this is what was happening to the patient, to the IMRT, this is what is happening to the patient. And then today with carbon ions and AV ions, the protons, you can deliver a very high dose of fraction radiation and precisely taking out the dose otherwise would have been spilled to the critical organs. Thank you. Yes, Thank you very much. How to use the session is open for this meeting. If no question, we move on to the meeting for the session. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for directing us with your best way to do it. Thank you very much, sir. Moving ahead, we have a talk by Dr. Milan Shetty, who will be introduced by Dr. Anand Pati, Professor at the Department of Surgery. Good evening, Bob. Uh, 
talk about uh, symptomatology to management in cancer of breast. I call upon Dr. Uh, Shetty, he is a senior consultant, radiation oncologist at the CCMR Cancer Center. Thank you, sir, for a wonderful introduction. Just a minute, sir. I'm uh, connecting my laptop. One minute, I'll be able to log in right now. Good evening, sir, for a wonderful introduction. Uh, today, thank and uh, I thank Anand Patil, sir, for giving me an opportunity to speak uh, in this uh, auspicious gathering. Sir, are you able to hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Today, my topic will be breast cancer from symptoms to management. Yeah. So before uh, starting with the uh, breast cancer, how do you work up the patient and all? We'll have a little brief introduction. First, as we all know, the breast cancer most common type is the ductal carcinoma, which starts in the lactiferous duct. Next, we have the lobular carcinoma, which starts in the lobules. So. Next, when the patient presents to us, how do they most more commonly present? The most common symptom will be the complaints of the lump in the breast or in the axilla with the uneven edges and it does not hurt. Patient will say that they have a lump in the breast which was gradually progressive in size and associated with the fullness of the breast. They will also notice gradually there is change in the size of the breast also as the size of the lump keeps on increasing. And similarly, and they will also notice that there is a change in the texture of the skin and there will be puckering of the skin, which you call it as skin dimpling or a pudy orange. And sometimes the patient will also complains of uh, fluid or nipple, uh, fluid or bloody discharge coming out from the nipple that can also signify as a ductal carcinoma or a Paget's disease. Similarly, in advanced cases, if the patient is having a bone metastasis, they do frequently present with the bone pain or in case of a locally advanced breast cancer, they come up with the breast pain or the discomfort. And in few cases, unfortunately, with the ulceration of the breast and in the swelling of the one arm of the breast due to lymphedema, because there is a blockage of the axillary lymphatics, which drains the upper limb. Now, how do we work up of the patients when they present to us? The most common uh, will be uh, to note the proper history, like we need to take the history of the patient with the risk factors laying that if there is any family members having a history of a breast cancer and if yes, like a first degree relative, second degree relative, we need to know that because some cancers like a BRCA1 and BRCA2, which causes breast cancer can be genetics. And we even have to know the gynecological history also and the menopausal history. And once we note the history of the patient and all, adequate general physical examination of utmost importance. General physical examination, we need to uh, make sure that pallor, edema, sinusitis, clubbing, iterus, and lymphadenopathy must be examined in detail. Next, we need to do a proper uh, neck examination and we need to look for the spine. Is there any tenderness or no? And when it comes to localized examination, we need to see what is the breast uh, tumor size and is there any satellite nodules on the skin or if it's a post-op case, 
or on the chest wall and similarly is there any changes in the nipple and eczematous lesion in the nipple or there is any discharge and next most important thing is symmetry what is the symmetry of the both the breast whether one breast is full or another breast we need to note it down next we need to examine the patient for the axillary nodes and the supraclavicular or the infraclavicular group of lymph nodes next co most common is once we do the history and physical examination we need to do the biopsy here core biopsy is more important compared to fnac why because we get to know the hormone receptor status like er pr and hrt nu which will help us in uh, deciding the new adjuvant treatment as well as hormone receptor status in the adjuvant treatment also next we need to do a baseline investigations baseline in the sense we need to do a complete blood examinations the renal function test the liver function test the serum electrolytes and 2d echo why 2d echo means we will be giving anthracycline based chemotherapeutic drugs which are cardiotoxic so we need to know the cardiac functions also next we need to do ct thorax and abdomen and bilateral mammogram here i would favor ct thorax and abdomen compared to mammogram because this will help us in detecting my if there is any chest wall involvement or if there is any lung metastasis and the axillary group of lymph nodes and the liver lesions also compared to mammogram and bone scan and mri brain is indicated here we do bone scan in case of locally advanced cases to see if there are any bone metastasis we do it routinely in our settings in locally advanced cases we do bone scan routinely mri brain is indicated only if the patient present with the cns symptoms like headache or blurring of vision or the altered sensorium loss of consciousness otherwise we routinely don't prescribe mri brain but if we have a opportunity for doing a pet ct for locally advanced breast cancer that would be my investigation of choice because that would help me in noting the lesions in the uh, lung liver as well as in the bone and in uh, some cases even the brain also so pet ct is not routinely recommended in case of early breast cancer whereas in case of locally advanced breast cancer we need to do a pet ct scan if the patient is not affordable then ct thorax and abdomen along with bone scan would be sufficient once the biopsy has been done and the in relative investigations has been done we need to do a tnm staging this tnm staging is based on t is the tumor size where we classify to t1 t2 t3 and t4 based on less than 2 cm 2 to 5 cm more than 5 cm or t4 is tumor which extends into the skin or the chest wall similarly we have the lymph, lymph nodes where is n1 is metastasis to the axillary lymph nodes but these are mobile whereas in case of n2 there are in case of metastasis to axillary group of lymph nodes which are fixed the difference between n1 and n2 is n1 we have mobile group of lymph nodes whereas in case of n2 is we have fixed group of lymph nodes and similarly internal mammary nodes but if the patient present with a supraclavicular group of lymph nodes and axillary or both internal mammary we call it as a n3 disease and similarly in case of metastasis is call it as a m0 and m1 where m1 suggest distant metastasis in case of liver lung bone and the brain this is a clinical uh, staging and the pathological staging is slightly different where we classify the nodes based on the number of nodes positive to the num to the number of nodes excised i mean to say that if the if there is in the region of 1 to 3 group of lymph nodes we classify it as n1 and if it is around 3 to 6 we call it as n2 n3 is 6 or more than 10 we routinely classify it and uh, whenever it's a pathological examination we say even the extra capsular spread is also very important because that will show that that axilla also needs to be irradiated and what are the treatment modalities we are having the most commonly in case of breast cancer we have surgery chemotherapy and radiation now coming to surgery the most common surgery which we do is breast conservation surgery or mastectomy the mastectomy earlier patients we patients used to go in for a radical mastectomy which involves removal of the breast pectoralis major and the minor muscles as well as axillary lymph node dissection up to level 1 to level 3 but routinely what we do nowadays is modified radical mastectomy this is the surgery where pectoralis major is spared 
Similarly, we have simple mastectomy that is removal of breast to the level of pectoris minor muscle with no lymph node dissection. Simple mastectomy is done in cases of fungating breast where we are only trying to remove the breast specimen and with not a curative intent. And similarly, there is one more mastectomy called as skin sparing mastectomy, which preserves the skin of the breast for reconstructive purposes. But skin sparing mastectomy, we don't do it when skin infiltration is present. Similarly, we have a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Earlier, I used to say about all breast cancer patient needs to undergo ALND. Yes, but few cases where there is clinically N0, that is axilla is negative on clinically imaging also. In that cases, we can do a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Here, what we do is we inject a methylene blue or a radioactive colloid and we just look at the lymphatics in the axilla. If any lymph node is positive, then we take it for a sampling. And if there is no lymphatics, we don't uh, uh, do the axial lymph node dissection. And in case of uh, axial lymph node dissection or a radiotherapy must be uh, indicated if there is sentinel lymph node is positive. Otherwise, we don't have to treat the axilla. Now, what are the contraindications to breast conserving therapy? Multicentricity. But there is a difference between multifocal and multicentric. Multifocal is there is a multiple breast uh, lumps in the same quadrant, whereas multicentric is in different quadrants of the breast, you have tumors. So in such cases, you cannot do breast conserving surgery. Next, the ratio of best tumor, tumor size to the breast. In case of a large tumor with a small breast or in case of small lump with a pendulous breast, the breast conserving surgery we usually don't advise. Or in case of diffuse microcalcifications, we routinely go ahead and do breast uh, modified radical mastectomy. We don't do breast conserving surgery. Or in case of repeated uh, doing of breast conserving surgery, we get persistent close of positive margin. Or if there is presence of extensive intraductal component, or in case of invasive lobular carcinoma, especially in a 35 to 40 year old, or diffuse or multiple close of positive margins. So in those cases, we don't do breast conserving surgery. Or if the patient has received a previous radiation to the breast and in case of scleroderma, breast conserving therapy is contraindicated. Next comes the role of chemotherapy. Chemotherapy we generally recommend in all patients greater than one centimeter in size or in node positive disease. Whereas in case of triple negative tumors, we should consider chemotherapy in all cases. Why? Because they have a higher rates of recurrence. But and they also have a lack of uh, endocrine therapy. Why? Because ERPR HER2 is negative. So if there is ERPR positive, we have a role of hormone therapy. Whereas in case of triple negative, we don't have hormone therapy. We just have a role of chemotherapy. That's why we consider chemotherapy in all cases of triple negative breast cancers. So the most common regimen which we follow at our center is adriamycin along with cyclophosphamide to a given every three, uh, three weekly to a duration of four cycles, followed by either paclitaxel or docetaxel given every three weekly for four more cycles. Here, what we do is if we are giving docetaxel, we give a growth factor support every three weekly. And if we are giving paclitaxel, we subject the patient every weekly instead of three weekly. So next we have a role of TC chemotherapy that is docetaxel along with cyclophosphamide, which we give it in early breast cancer of four cycles. Similarly, we used to have FAC with consisting of 5-FU, idramycin and cyclophosphamide given for six cycles. Then you have a TAC regimen that is taxanes where we substitute 5-FU with uh, docetaxel along with idramycin and cyclophosphamide given for six cycles. Similarly, we have FEC where idramycin is substituted with epirubicin. Why? Because Adriamycin, the maximum tolerable dose is 450 milligram, whereas epirubicin has a tolerance dose of 900 milligram. That means it is lesser cardiotoxic compared to adriamycin or doxorubicin. Earlier, in the age-old regimen, we used to follow CMF, which we routinely don't follow. But that used to have a lowest incidence of alopecia. Similarly, when we combine uh, anthracyclines with the taxanes and all, the patient's most common symptoms is uh, hair loss only. And whenever we are giving docetaxel, we need to make sure we have to give a growth factor support 
otherwise febrile neutropenia will be very common and the dose is always given in terms of body surface area with height and weight as the most common mode of measurement next comes a term called as dose dense chemotherapy here as said we are giving chemotherapy every uh, three weekly cycles dose dense says we are trying to shorten the duration of chemotherapy that is instead of giving for three weekly we end up giving for two weekly this helps us in reducing the uh, overall treatment time of uh, chemotherapy so that the patient can go for radiation therapy earlier and can complete the total course of treatment and whenever you are giving dose dense chemotherapy we need to make sure growth factors has to be given otherwise neutropenia will be the most common complications next common term is dose intense chemotherapy dose in intense is i am increasing the dosage of the given drug the duration remains 3 weekly only dose intense is usually prescribed in dose dense and dose intense usually done in uh, locally advanced breast cancer where we need to make the systemic spread is not uh, i mean to say that systemic spread is reduced and or systemic uh, spread can be taken care of next the role of new adjuvant chemotherapy the we usually see most of the cases operable breast has been operated and then they come for chemotherapy in a locally advanced breast cancer with t3 or a node positive cases but at our center what we do is any locally advanced breast cancer or any triple negative breast cancer including t2 disease we subject them for new adjuvant chemotherapy why we subject them for new new adjuvant chemotherapy is this is based on fisher's model who suggested that breast is both uh, low systemic disease but right now we have a helmans hypothesis hypothesis which states that breast is both local as well as systemic by giving new adjuvant chemotherapy i am trying to down shrink the tumor so that in case uh, patient has to undergo breast conserving surgery breast conserving surgery can be done and it can be take systemic spread also can be taken care because once the surgery has been done the patient will come to us after 3 to 4 weeks that means one month of valuable time will be lost so by giving new adjuvant chemotherapy we are not only down uh, sizing the tumor we are we are taking care to, to make sure that the systemic spread also doesn't occur so at our center for all triple negative breast cancer we follow new adjuvant chemotherapy and while practicing new adjuvant chemotherapy in case of uh, triple negative breast cancer for a t2 lesion what we do is we do marking on the lump or a tumor to make sure that when the tumor shrinks only the lump can be done otherwise once that if there is a complete response it becomes very difficult for the treating surgeon where to operate next is the role of trastuzumab trastuzumab is a if in patients of her to positive tumor we usually give trastuzumab every weekly or every three weekly for a one year duration now the recent trend also has come for a short course of uh, trastuzumab given for six months also at our center for early breast cancer we follow it a short course regimen and in locally advanced breast cancer or in presence of any other risk factors we usually prescribe it for one year next comes the role of hormone therapy hormone therapy is recommended for all er positive tumors regardless of age menopausal status and nodal status here we have uh, two categories first one is selective estrogen receptor modulators like tamoxifen raloxifen this is indicated in both pre and post menopausal women and aromatase inhibitors like anastrozole letrozole and eximestine for post menopausal patients what we do at our center is if the patient is uh, pre menopausal we usually prescribe tamoxifen for a duration of 5 years and if it's a post menopausal patients we usually prescribe anastrozole for a period of 5 years and the recent trend also has come that instead of 5 years we can increase up to 10 years also but when it comes to a perimenopausal patient we need to be very careful how we are going to select the regimen what we do in such cases is we start with tamoxifen for a period of 2 years then switch over to aromatase inhibitors for the remaining 3 to 5 years duration when we are prescribing aromatase inhibitors we need to make sure that we need to give calcium supplementation also calcium supplementation must be given to the patient when we are prescribing uh, aromatase inhibitors 
for when now comes the role of adjuvant radiation therapy first for the post mrm indications this is indicated in presence of uh, t3 tumor t3 t4 tumors or in presence of closer positive margin in presence of lvsr perineural invasion or in case of gross extra capsular extension and in case of node positivity in case of gross extra capsular extension we have to treat the axilla also compared to the chest wall and supraclavicular area what are the techniques of radiation we usually start radiation by 2 to 4 weeks of surgery so that the wound subsides and the wound healing is adequate and the suture has been removed for patients receiving chemotherapy we start the radiation by 3 to 4 weeks after the last cycle and the patients usually treated in a supine position with the customized immobilization device we have a orbit uh, cast which use, which we use for immobilization and we, what we do is we bilaterally abduct the arms of the patient and externally the head is rotated to the opposite side and we need to make sure that all the surgical scars and the drain sites are wired why wired means uh, we need to cover it in a treatment field also if the uh, if there is any uh, clo close or positive margin we usually boost the surgical uh, scar area this is the aquaplast uh, or the orbit cast which i was telling here we have two markings you can see one marking which we have done while doing the treatment next what we do is when we take the treatment we get to know how the patient has to be shifted and all this is the second margin ma marking which we do while starting the treatment and this marking we usually we done till the patient complete the treatment and we should enter the mastectomy scar flaps surgical clips and the drain site as i said should be included in the treatment fields and the planning ct scan has to be done based on 3 mm sections for imrt and 5 mm sections for uh, 3d crt and the here my target volume is mainly the chest wall and the supraclavicular fossa and axilla if in case of extra capsular spread is there this is the case of mrm where we have done a chest wall rt here i have treated with the help of electrons why are favor elect here why treated with electrons is for treating chest wall at end to favor electrons compared to photons because i get a lesser dose to the lungs here i am able to spare the lungs better if i had to use photons i would have placed my tangential fields making my this uh, lung and the heart coming in the field of radiation thereby reducing the dose by using electrons when we are using electrons we need to make sure that we uh, give a coverage of 85 percentage whereas in case of using photons and all we go for 95 percent coverage here i could see the entire area whatever i have to treat 85 percent is covering adequately next comes the dose the dose which we give is a dose of 50 to 54 gray at 1.8 gray to 2 gray for fractions to chest wall and 45 to 54 gray to supraclavicular fossa and in case of uh, electron boost is done with care to the scars which are positive in high risk patients that is in case of closer positive margin so dose of 60 to 66 gray and next is a term called as heart sparing that is called as deep inspiratory breath holding you can see in the first field where i have treated tangential photons heart is coming in the field of radiation what we do in this second picture is we tell the patient to take a deep inspiration hold the breath so that the heart everything is pushed down so that we can adequately spare it next comes the role of breast conserving surgery uh, what is the role of radiation all cases of breast conserving surgery should undergo radiation irrespective of tumor size and the area of treatment will be whole breast with or without supraclavicular area why is supraclavicular is if it's node positive then i will treat a supraclavicular area otherwise i will be treating the whole breast only next once i treat the whole breast i have to do do boost to the lumpectomy cavity why do a boost to the lumpectomy cavity because that's where the site of recurrences are uh, tend to happen next the dose is what we usually prescribe is 50 grain 25 fractions followed by boost to the lumpectomy cavity and the boost dose is 10 to 16 gray this is a case of whole breast radiation we have treated in the first when we are treating the chest wall we are including the pectoralis muscle also here whereas in case of whole breast we will only treat this area we are not including the chest wall that's the difference between whole breast radiation and the chest wall irradiation when we are treating whole breast rt only the breast uh, tissue will be 
created a not the chest wall this is my area of interest as i said whole breast similarly this is one picture where we have uh, done a tangential treatment like uh, not a, this uh, tangential treatment using wedges for the whole breast uh, irradiation so with the boost plan you get to see this is where surgeon has placed the clips and my area of interest is only this area for doing the boost irradiation whereas the my area of interest in the first phase is this entire area that is the whole breast and if you can see from this picture this is the whole breast area which i'll be treating this is the boost area with the margin i'm treating because that's the my area of recurrences this is the lung which i'm sparing it so axillary irradiation the only indication for axilla is when there is a gross perinodal extension and in case of inadequate axilla dissection as i said we usually see what is the number of nodes excised and what is the number of nodes positive if there are less than 10 number of nodes uh, which are excised we invariably end up treating the axilla that is still based upon the how many nodes are positive and how many are negative if it's uh, if they are removed seven group of seven uh, lymph nodes and if none are positive then we don't treat the axilla but if there are three to four lymph nodes which are positive and seven to eight uh, lymph nodes isolated then we definitely have to treat the axilla because that has been a inadequate uh, dissection has been done now coming to the role of hypofractionation earlier we used to speak about conventional therapy of 50 grain 25 fractions but at our center what we do for uh, early breast cancer is we do hypofractionation that means to reduce the total duration of time here what we do is we prescribe a dose of 40 grain 15 fractions or 42.5 grain 16 fraction based on the start uh, a and b trial of the uk so here in this case instead of completion of treatment in 5 weeks we are completing the treatment in 3 weeks only so similarly there are other trials known as fast and fast forward trials in the fast trial what they have done is why should we complete the treatment in 3 weeks we can as well do it in one week also yes we can complete the treatment even in one week also that is for a five fractions only and in case of fast forward trial what they have done is weekly one fractions they used to give for a total of five weeks but we have to make sure that whenever we are giving hypofractionation this is useful only in case of early breast cancer and in case of node n0 and n1 if there is axilla you are going to treat and if there is a high nodal burden and conventional therapy is still the way to go and not hypofractionation now the role of imrt and igrt imrt is intensity moderate radiation therapy whereas igrt is image guided what we do as our previous speaker suggested in uh, treating the breast the lungs also move with uh, respiration and similarly for uh, treating whole breast the lumpectomy cavity and the breast also tend to move with respiration here we take the help of a imaging so that adequate matching can be done and we can fix to the localized area only next comes the role of apbi apbi is nothing but accelerated partial breast irradiation the concept came into the picture because instead of treating the entire breast the role of uh, recurrence and the uh, um, target miss is mainly in the near the area of the lumpectomy cavity what they found out is if we treat only the partial breast instead of treating the whole breast that would be sufficient to maintain a adequate control just like when you have done the whole breast radiation this can be done by either external beam radiation therapy or by using brachytherapy this brachytherapy can be even in the form of interstitial brachytherapy or with the help of uh, inter mammocytes also next we take the help of gating as i said earlier dibs that is deep inspiratory breath holding so that patient only when they take the breath and they come into the field only the treatment will be done next comes the role of tomotherapy and cybernet tomotherapy is a, something like a ct machine where we end up treating slice by slice so the advantage of this is reduce toxicity to the normal tissues and the patient will also get a accurate dose of radiation and when it comes to cyber knife we are not doing it when we are treating the whole breast or a chest wall irradiation but cyber knife definitely is useful when we are treating metastatic breast cancer especially in case of bone mats or in the brain mats as well as in liver mats and the lung mats also now what are the organs at risk when we are giving irradiation 
that is mainly the lungs we need to make sure that the volume of the lungs which are irritating should come into the prescribed volume and the heart especially the left ventricle and the spinal cord and the opposite breast also is at risk when we are treating the breast cancer patients be it in case of uh, mrm or in case of bcs next comes the role of palliative rt palliative means we are not aiming at any cure we are only trying to relieve the symptoms the symptoms means pain relief of the patient this can be in the bone or in the brain the dose can be varying from 30 grain 10 fractions to 20 grain 5 fractions based on the patient general condition but if there is any bleeding as i said where we prescribe toilet mastectomy and all in case we prescribe 8 grain single fractions only once we do the treatment and hormonal therapy we have started we subject the patient for follow up the first year follow up will be every 1 to 2 monthly what we do is first follow up will be after 1 month and after every 2 months till the end of first year we subject them for follow up and every 3 monthly for the second year then 6 monthly up to 5 years and then annually whenever the patient comes to us we need to make sure that in case of bcs we need to get a bilateral mammogram annually or in case of uh, mrm patients opposite breast mammogram has to be done plus along with that uh, chest x ray and ultrasound uh, abdomen and pelvis has to be done so thank you any questions from the audience Let me begin with uh, respectful namaste to all my teachers here. Uh, a big hello from ground zero to all the delegates, the illustrious delegates who we have heard for this while. Uh, my talk is about head and neck cancers. On this illustrious occasion of uh, ninth episode of our CRPC Memorial CME on Aapoj. Uh, namaste. I'm Dr. Shailesh Kanu. I try to complete the core of surgical oncology in the wheel of cancer management. Why are we here? Uh, CR Vidhi's work of life has inspired the next generations to study about cancer, to know about cancer, because it is a significant problem, especially so with our country. Azor of Mizoram is world's highest has world's highest incidence of liver pharyngeal cancer. Similarly, different places in India, New Delhi being world's highest incidence of ball bladder cancer, which was in 2014. Varthani or Nagpur was world's highest incidence of mouth cancers overall. Pondicherry and Kohima in Nagaland had also high amounts of head and neck cancers. Based on that, I we are here to study about head and neck cancers, and this is how the presentation is going to be seen. introduction anatomy epidemiology clinical presentation management and management introduction 
Adrenal cancers are the malignant tumors of upper aerodigestive tract. Globally, these are sixth most common type of cancer, but in India, this is fifth most common type, which we'll also come across when we are dealing with epidemiology. Now, not all head and neck cancers is, is what we are going to discuss about. 48% of head and neck cancers, which is the biggest chunk of it, are oral cancers. And 90% of all oral cancers are squamous cell carcinomas. The next, immediate next uh, frequency of histological type in oral cancers uh, would be a surprise or hard to believe fact, but they are non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, why are, why are these so interesting? Why these are a diverse group of cancers and they can have, they can present in different parts of oral cavity and they demand different management for each type. And uh, the mainstay of their treatment is surgery. All the oral cancers, mainstay of treatment is surgery. Of course, they have an attempt in radiotherapy and chemotherapy along with a significant role of rehabilitation. In those patients who survive, a lot of them have pain, disfigurement, physical disability, which can have an enormous psychosocial impact. So there is more and more role of rehabilitation. Anatomy of oral cavity starts with lip, gingiva, just an overview of uh, bird's eye view, uh, soft palate, buccal mucosa and retromolar trigon. These are our areas of interest because this is where we find a lot of tumor. Now, it can be seen that the anterior two-thirds or the front two-thirds of the tongue is a little licked as compared to that behind the circumvallate papilla, the posterior one third. That again is because this is what interests us as in this is what is treated by surgery and the things behind may require definitive radiation. Complex picture here, but let me just summarize it in a simple manner. These are these two images represent the neck node, anatomy of neck. That is what makes the surgical management all the more intricate. The arrangement of all these structures in a very small space. Why is this important? We have level one A nodes, which are submental, level one B, submandibular. Below the mandible, lined by digastric. Level 2, upper jugular, which is divided into 2A and 2B by spinal accessory nerve, which is an important cranial nerve. 3 is the middle part of sternocleidomastoid. 4 is the lower third of sternocleidomastoid. 5 is the posterior triangle. 6 and 7 are in the central aspect of it. We can see a lot of important structures here. As we just mentioned, spinal accessory nerve, internal jugular vein, carotid artery, the phrenic nerve, thoracic duct, so on and so forth. Now, this in a way is combination of the first two pictures because it tries to give us an impression how the spread happens. For example, submental triangle can be involved in cancer of lip. Submandibular in anterior two thirds of tongue and tumors of floor of mouth. Upper jugular may be involved in nasopharyngeal tumors. And usually, this is the direction. We can have lymph node spread starting here and going further. But there is one distinct arrow here which shows that tumors from lung may also come and be in the posterior tram. Now, this knowledge of spread of or direction of spread of lymph node, lymph node disease gives us a choice to selectively dissect the lymph nodes of the tongue, thus reducing morbidity for the patient. Epidemiology, as we just saw, sixth most common cancer in the world. The Globe Act 2018 estimated that head neck cancers, head neck cancer patients for that year was 8,34,860. Out of them, 4,31,000 died in that year. Almost one third of all the head neck cancers 
are same in India. We have got the second highest number of oral cancer cases, and the risk is supposed to be increasing in the Indian subcontinent. It was estimated that India spent around two, three, eight, six crores in 2020 for oral cancers or head neck cancers. Lifetime risk of developing an oral cavity cancer or oropharyngeal cancer is about 1.7% in men and 0.7% for women. Again, this shows that South Central Asia, where we are, this has a high number of oral cancers, especially in men. Now, it is not just about the numbers, it is how they present as well. We have this graph which shows at what level do different cancers present to us. What is worth noting here? Head neck cancers have a loco regionally advanced stage of presentation in 66.6%. Next to it is CA cervix, in, which has 60%, and CA breast, which is 57%. So, about not, not about two thirds of oral cancer patients present in a stage which is loco regionally advanced. That makes treatment all the more challenging. What are risk factors? Tobacco is a significant risk factor. 86.5% of all the patients in India who had oral cancers were tobacco chewers or were exposed to tobacco in form of smoking or smokeless tobacco. What is smokeless tobacco? Smokeless tobacco is when consumption of gutka, pan masala, tambaku, that is all called smokeless tobacco. Alcohol consumption was identified as an independent risk factor for occurrence of oral cancers. And this was seen in 23.2% of patients who had oral cancer. Combination of both had a worse uh, impact, which we can see here. The median overall survival in a patient of head neck cancer stage 2. If the patient was a non-tobacco exposed or someone who did not consume tobacco, was 72%. Whereas with tobacco, it came down to 43%. With tobacco and alcohol, the same stage, the survival was 29. Now, this was an interesting uh, statistic that was brought out in 2020. In India, it was found the consumption of tobacco uh, to the total population. When ratio was found, it was about 25.9% of total population was sup supposed to be consuming tobacco in some form or other. Whereas in the US, it was 3.6%. It was only smokeless tobacco, I'm sorry. Whereas in the USA, it was 3.6%. Alcohol per capita intake in India in a year was 5.7 liters, whereas in USA, it was 9.8 liters. Uh, there is something really good uh, uh, inspiration for people in India to compete. HPV infection was another uh, big cause for uh, oral cancers, but uh, most of the smokeless tobacco uh, tumors of oral cancers were found to be HPV negative. So, in India, the rate was 7.4 to 10.5 percent among all the oral cancer tumors, whereas in USA it was 73 percent, which is a very striking. Other risk factors were chronic irritation and poor oral hygiene. Um, the increase in uh, uh, oral cancer incidences was associated with consumption of to tobacco or consumption of pan masala. This was this. There was a few slides which, in which we are trying to give tribute to how it was promoted. Not only Indian stars, there were also some James Bond kind of stars who. Became and data became means for their uh, endorsement of the work. How do oral cancers present? Usually, the pre-malignant lesions are visible, but it is again difficult uh, because of smokeless tobacco to identify in Indian population. Leukoplakia, which are white patches, erythroplakia, red patches, which are higher risk than leukoplakia, oral candidiasis, submucosal fibrosis, which makes patient have difficulty in opening their mouths wide, oral lichen planus. 
all these are risk factors for pre malignant conditions for oral cancer. Now, these are different symptoms in oral cancers leukoplakia, erythroplakia, mouth sore or oral ulcer, which are not healed for more than two weeks, difficulty in chin or tongue activity, difficulty in opening of mouth, oral numbness, or long term hoarseness of voice. Management would start with clinical evaluation. Different steps of clinical evaluation considered as important even for screening of oral cavity clinical examination. What we do in general evaluation is ECOG status, Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group status, wherein ECOG 0 is a fit patient, ECOG 5 is a dead patient. Up to ECOG 2, patients may sustain surgery well. We try to evaluate their nutritional status, cardiac fitness, EIT and dental evaluation because we need to see what teeth are to be taken out if we have to save the flaps when we are doing it. Investigations would include general and specific investigations, general investigations to understand basic health profile of the patient. Specific investigations, we need imaging, local imaging, uh, a preferable local imaging would be MRI or in some cases CCT. Metastatic workup, again, CCT thorax is what we usually practice, but PET CT scan can also be a very good imaging for imaging modality for metastatic work. We need biopsy for tissue diagnosis. Okay, we've done all this and we come to this conclusion. You see, okay, his condition is serious, but the location is hilarious. This is what NCCN tells us. Most important thing in uh, oral cancer is resection. That is the mainstay of treatment. And based on histopathology of what we get, we are going to go ahead and give adjuvant treatment. So, planning of surgery. Surgery requires wide local excision with selective neck node dissection. It may require mandibulectomy, which can again be either marginal mandibulectomy, wherein we remove only a small part of mandible, keeping the shaft intact. Segmental mandibulectomy, a short segment of mandible along with the tumor is taken out, or hemimandibulectomy. There may be, based on the kind of resection that we have done, a requirement of flap reconstruction. But this requires a multidisciplinary approach. We need to involve dent dentistry, ENT specialist, plastic surgeon, obviously for flaps, nutritionist to maintain the nutritional supply, speech therapy as and when required, psycho-oncology to uh, help them deal with the trauma that they undergo, physiotherapy and a significant role of pathologists in frozen section and histopathology. These are the flaps that we usually use. PMMC stands for pectoralis major myocutaneous flap, nasolabial flap, pectoral flap and if we have the kind of facilities we can do pre forearm flaps or pre fibula flaps. These are flaps which are taken from native tissue and anastomosis is done in the area of neck or the oral cavity. After we have dissected the tumor and we have had pathological examination based on the final histopathological histopathology, patient may be subjected for adjuvant radiation or systemic therapy. Now, what in final histopathology prompts us to send them there? The adverse features, which is nodal involvement, extranodal extension, involved or closed margins, high grade of tumor, pathologically T3 or T4 disease, pathologically N2 or N3. Involvement, perineural or lymphovascular invasion. Based on this, I just give a brief uh, experience that we have had in treating a few patients that the surgeries which were done in BLD in medical college. We had a 55 year old male patient with growth in lower right buccal mucosa. On examination, there was also a proliferative growth in right lower vagina buccal surface extending from canine to the first molar. Level 1 B node was palpable. Biopsy said squamous cell carcinoma with no distal metastasis. Patient had wide excision with marginal mandibulectomy and selective neck dissection. The reconstruction was done by a nasolabial flap. This was the tumor after excision of which this was the flap that was taken. 
45 year old female with growth over the right lower buckwood and pulses on examination had also proliferative growth on the right right lower uh, aspect with uh, first molar to second molar wide local excision with segmental mandibulectomy was done and this was a hpr staging this is the growth a lip split incision This was the final result. Another patient, 65 year old male with right lower buccal mucosa lesion. This patient had PMMC flap reconstruction done. The whole mandible here was the segment of mandible was removed along with the neck dissection. You can see the internal jugular vein. This is the omohyoid. This is the spinal accessory nerve. Here you can see the marking for pectoralis major flap. This is how the patient ended. We had a patient who had a lip lesion for which we did what is called as Abbey extender flap. This is how this was the outcome of the surgery. She ended up having micro ostia, but oncologically she was clear and she did require a revision for her micro ostia. Finally, a 78 year old male patient with growth in the left lower buccal mucosa, which had spread to the adjacent skin, causing an ulceration over the cheek. He was taken up for wide local excision with segmental mandibulectomy. He did what is called as a bipedal PMMC flap. This was his cheek ulcer and the region inside. The cut end of the mandible when we were doing segmental mandibulectomy. The tumor, when we excised medial aspect and the lateral aspect, this was the tumor, and these were the margins. This is how the patient should go. A way forward. We as an institution are equipped to handle more such cases and on regular basis. The only problem here till now we have had is patient retention. With uh, a comprehensive oncology care, we can retain those patients. With patient awareness, with the help of our colleagues in dental department, EAP, we can have early diagnosis uh, and a better treatment. Plastic surgery, assistance. In future, we can think of free flaps for more complex resections. We can also think of having dedicated staff for surgical assistance or post-op rehabilitation for such patients. Thank you. This is calendar of events for uh, awareness of cancers. So the wonderful talk is given to you. Any questions from uh, the audience? If there are no more questions, then I think you are going to uh, give me this important to share this session. And uh, since we have a university representative here, I think that's sir. And you look into the demand of uh, our colleagues, uh, we need to have a comprehensive oncology because we have plastic surgeon, we have oncologists, and they do the water work. And we look into this, and we need to have a comprehensive oncology and oncology. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. 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 We would like to thank all the eminent speakers who have participated in today's CAP and we assure you that we shall send you the certificate of participation by email. We thank you once again for a very useful and enlightening afternoon. I would also like to say that from time to time, whenever required, we shall seek your assistance and guidance. Um, 
in helping the management of our patients. Now I have the request Dr. R. C. advisor for the CME to say a few words about continuing medical education. We would like to thank uh, the scientific and academic research society for hosting this CME program and making it a success. And I would also like to thank all the speakers, many of which who were widely experienced. A special word of thanks to our own guest speaker from our faculty whose presentation was really excellent and uh, it was stimulating for us to develop further departments of oncology and oncosurgery. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Dr. Sidney Tumai, Secretary of the Scientific Good evening. It's my pleasure to propose the vote of thanks for today's CME. So I would like to thank our chief patron, Dr. Nipatil Sir, Honorable Chancellor of Yale University, uh, for his blessings. I would like to thank our partner, Dr. R. Sopor, Honorable Vice Chancellor, for his continued support. I would like to thank Dr. J.J. Ambekar, sir, the registrar of the University, who made it to the CME in person. I would like to thank Dr. Kamil Patel, sir, principal dean of faculty of medicine for his support. I also like to thank faculty of allied health science dean, Dr. Tracy Namda, our vice principal academics, Dr. S.V. Patel, uh, medical superintendent, Dr. Rajesh Murthy, sir, for their valuable inputs. I also like to thank Dr. R. C. Bidri, sir, ex principal and professor of medicine, who meticulously edited the master of ceremony and helped us in all aspects of conducting the CME. I would like to thank our esteemed speaker for today's uh, CME, Dr. P. S. Dattatre, Mr. Janata Mandiga, Dr. Milin Shetty, and Dr. Shailesh Panna. I would like to thank other members of SARS. MC Arvandala, Chairman, and Dr. Sandhya Yathgiri for the continued support. I would like to thank Gaurav for his wonderful anchoring. I'd like to thank the IT uh, department staff and the uh, support staff without whom this event wouldn't have been successful. Thank you, Arvandala. Please proceed to the IT.